Please have the clerk take roll. Councilmember Althaus? Here. Councilmember Halts? Here. Councilmember Howdigie? Here. Councilmember Matthews? Here. Councilmember Nairn? Here. Vice Mayor Henry? Here. Mayor Alinsky? Here. Thank you. Okay, there's just one item on the agenda tonight, but it's a big one. Budget for fiscal year 2019 2020 presentation, discussion, and direction to staff regarding the proposed budget. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Mayor and Council, I'm Kristen Lynn, the Financial Services Director for the City of Pinewood. Tonight we're going to talk budget. Um, there is only one item. We're kind of hoping we can get through all of it tonight and maybe not have to come back tomorrow night. So are we. Yes. I will try to be quick. Not to be I, I do think we have a consensus on that. <laughs> well, that, that's the easy one. Then. <laughs> um, this is the fiscal year 2020 budget, which starts July 1st, 2019. So you've seen this slide a few times. It kind of just describes our process, um, where we are in the process. And currently we are in the April to June meet with council, present and discuss the budget. This will be our first presentation <coughs> on the actual budget. Um, this is kind of our proposed budget. We will be back once um, we have everything ready in June for the tentative budget adoption. And that tentative budget actually sets our expenditure limitation. So that's the first one you'll vote on. And it sets the expenditure limitation for fiscal year 2020. And then we'll be back in July, I think it's like the first week of July, to have the final budget adopted. And then on we go to more budget stuff in our department. And um, I gave this presentation to the city staff today. So I was telling them the whole process and how we don't stop. It kind of goes to September and then we start all over again. Mr. Mayor, if I can interject, I just to meet the goals of the strategic plan. So we've already met with uh, one outreach group. We've met with employees twice in preparing the budget. We met with them again twice today. We talked about the budget on Inside Cottonwood for the city manager's uh, presentation. Um, Rudy has scheduled some meetings with some other nonprofits and other um, groups in the community. And I left an open-ended invite on Inside Cottonwood to go to any other group to talk about the budget. We have a town hall, uh, thanks to Marianne, next week on the budget. So we are doing what we can to um, open the doors for public input. Great. Thank you. So fiscal year 2020 current balance budget. We're bringing you a balance proposed budget. Um, we've had lots of discussion. The current proposed budget is $75,379,780. And that seems like a very large number, I know. Um, it, every year it seems like a really large number, but it, it includes all grant opportunities, all reserves, all carryovers, transfers in and out from different to different funds, um, and indirect costing. So that's why it's such a high number. Um, and it's, but we're budgeting everything we could possibly think of that we might need for the next year to make sure that we have our expenditure limit, our expenditure limit set high enough that we can do what we need to be doing. Um, I also want you to know that the total budget of 75 million is only 8% over fiscal year 2019's total budget and that the general fund budget is less than 2% over the 2019 budget that was adopted. So expenditures for all funds. Um, as I said, it's 75 million and the majority of those of that money is for the general fund at 37% and the water fund at 37%. Those are obviously our two largest. The general fund is made up of several different departments, um, you know, as administration and you have planning and zoning and you have public safety and you have a lot of different departments in the general fund. And then our other funds are much smaller percentages of that large budget. Um, this year our grant funds a little bit higher, which would be in the special projects fund. Um, Streets and Herf is also in the special projects fund, library special projects fund. So those are all rolled up into there. And if I can also add, please notice the 2%. So we're actually only spending 2% of that budget on debt service. It's an important number. 
So the general fund, um, I did say this is 37% of the overall 75 million. The general fund is made up of several different funds, um, different departments, and the general services, which is administration, city council, city clerk, finance, human resources, IT, purchasing and natural resources is 31% of that general fund budget. And then public safety is 43% of that general fund budget. So obviously public safety is our largest portion of our general fund budget, and that's police, fire, communications, ordinance enforcement, legal, and um, our municipal court. So when I was saying about how large it's 75 million and everything that's included in that budget, um, I just want to make sure that you know that that's <coughs> revenues incl including any anticipated grant funds. Um, if we think we might get that grant, we budget the expense and the revenue for it. We, that's carryovers, expenditures, reserves, indirect costing, and operating transfers in and out. Now, a carryover is the money that we have from the previous year or our fund balance that we put into the budget as a revenue um, to show that we have that balance available. And then um, a carry a reserve would be any budgeted reserves that we have afterwards. So they usually like the carryover from one year matches the reserve, or the reserve from one year ma can match the carryover for the next year. Um, so this is kind of a breakdown of how that works. Just a simplified version <laughs> um, to show you where that 75 million number comes from. <coughs> If you look at the 2019 and the 2020 budget, you'll see that the estimated revenues, um, not including grant revenues, is really around, 2019 is really around 37 million. 2020 is really around 39 million. And the estimated expenditures are really around 33 million and 46 million. But we budget all reserves, we budget all carryover, we budget indirect costing, we budget transfers in and out. And you can see the transfers in and out the revenue and the expense match because we're transferring from one fund to another. So they go, you have an expense in the general fund and a revenue in the HERF fund to cover that transfer in and out to that fund or the library. You can also notice that the budgeted reserves for 2019, which are about 25 million, and the carryover of 4 million come very close to totaling the 29 million total budget carryover in 2020 because that's what's remaining that we carry over to the next year to use as part of our fund balance for projects or things that didn't happen, projects that didn't happen that we still have money for that we're carrying to the next year. So the reserves, um, we've discussed the reserves several times in one of the discussions that we had uh, um, over the half cent sales tax, we talked about what we were gonna put into reserves and how we were gonna allocate all that when we increase the sales tax. And we always, every year, budget a general fund reserve of 16.67% of the previous year's expenditures. That's 60 days coverage. Um, this year's budget will be 3.43 million. It's a little bit up from last year. Um, and then the CIP that was set by council a few years ago at a million dollars. And then the undesignated reserves is kind of, um, left for council to fund any projects that aren't funded in the budget, could be added to the budget, and if we have anything between now and the tentative budget, we could take those funds out of the undesignated reserve and not really affect any other line items in the budget. We also have the half cent sales tax reserve funding for fiscal year 2020, and we're putting in um, to streets $647,000 from that Hassent sales tax directly to the streets programs. And then we have a transit matching. And transit is a grant. Um, it's a federal grant that we get from through ADOT. And it always has matching. We always have to cover a portion of that. It's not a fully 100% funded grant. So there's always funds that get transferred to the transit program to help cover those costs. We have the pension liability um, that we are going to fund at 259,000 and that will be an additional payment that we would pay, use to pay down the unfunded liability. <coughs> 
And then we have money in reserves for infrastructure and capital for future needs at 259,000. And then a general fund cash reserve that we are actually gonna put as cash in the bank of 388,000. And that is the breakdown, the 80% breakdown that was said we would do for um, this, the city sales tax increase of a half cent. Okay, so operating transfers, I kind of explained a little bit earlier. Um, to, to show you what those operating transfers are, I kind of broke it out so that you could see. The library will get $883,000 transferred from the general fund to the library fund to cover its costs. Because the library budget's around a million dollars and we get about $158,000 from Yavapai County for that program. And then we get some fines and fees and some other small items. I think there's a small grant in there as well, so there's the grant revenue. Um, and then the remainder has to be transferred over from the general fund to cover that. Same thing with the cemetery. There is really no revenue at the cemetery. Um, all, the all the plots have been sold. <laughs> and um, so we are transferring 122000 over from the general fund to cover their expenditures at the cemetery. And then the grant fund expenditures. Now we have some very large grants that we're, we're planning for this next year and one of them is uh, the Old Town Flood project that was brought to council a few months ago. I don't remember exactly. <coughs> but it's like a $2.7 million project. And so there is a 25% matching. So our matching would be $700,000 if you were funding the whole project in next year. We're actually funding 60% of that project for next year because it, the grant wouldn't start till October anyway. And we, you know, we're anticipating that it won't be done by June. So we're only doing 60% of that grant. And then there are other um, grants like the airport grant and where we are required to provide 5% of that matching. And there's a couple other small grants in there that require matching that will be going into the grant fund. So um, anticipated grants, all anticipated grants are budgeted. We budget the expenditure and the revenue and the match. Um, and the expenses for anticipated grants are 5.1 million. Like I said, a big one is the uh, FEMA Old Town floodplain. And then the other big one would be the transit grant. Um, that's a pretty big grant. And it's a pretty large match too. So, and the airport, those are our three largest. We have some small grants. Um, we have a state parks grant, a C the CDBG grant, but the CDBG grant is 100% funded. Um, and then we have <coughs> some governor officer, gov government officers highway safety grants at the police department that they have applied for for next year. Okay, sales tax. This is always a fun one. <laughs> so when looking at projecting sales tax revenues for this, the remainder of this year and for next year, and doing my projections, I noticed that our sales tax has kind of stopped its climb. <laughs> um, I'm only projecting that we are gonna get a 2% increase this year over last year. So for fiscal year 2018 to 19 is only a 2%, and we're only budgeting a 2% from 19 to 20. And we did, check around and ask neighboring communities, you know, what they were planning and what they were seeing. And we basically heard the same thing, that sales tax has flattened and that we're not seeing the same, that same increase in sales tax revenues that we had been seeing before in the last few years. And they also um, told me that one city is budgeting a flat, so they're not even budgeting an increase in sales tax for next year. And the other city said they're doing also a 2% increase in sales tax for next year. <coughs> so this graph is taxable sales. So you'll see that um, those are large numbers. <laughs> and this is the taxable sales based on um, some reports we get from the Arizona Department of Revenue. And then this is what we base our sales, our, our tax revenue off of for the next year. What, is it, what does the state project for sales tax? They're projecting a 6% increase, um, but they do have a larger area of, to look at, so it's 
it is higher than what we're projecting. Do you know how they've been, <coughs> excuse me, trending with their estimates? That <laughs> they've been pretty spot on? Well, I, I just was in a phone call today where they said that their revenue estimates aren't as high as they anticipated them to be for this year. So that was the Wayfair phone call. <laughs> <clears throat> there, um, sometimes that number is used to balance budgets. <laughs> Black magic. <laughs> Smoke and mirrors. So um, this is our actual sales tax figures for the last 10 years, um, what we've brought in. And you can see the last two years, it shows the 3% and then that half cent increase um, and what it would be. And you can see if you look at 2018 and 1918 is the bottom red and the 19, I mean 20, 1920. All these years are hard to remember. Um, <laughs> that I'm estimating we're going to bring in about 1.4 million extra from that half cent, and then next year we'll bring in uh, 2.6 from that half cent sales tax increase. Mr. Mayor, yeah, go, go ahead. Well, please notice that the difference without that half cent is only about $300,000. So had we not, had you not instituted the half cent sales tax our revenue from sales tax would only be growing by that 300,000. Um, so again, um, we talked about what we were gonna do with that half cent sales tax last year when we, when we talked about enacting it. Um, and this is basically the breakdown of where those monies have gone for fiscal year 2019 and where they are budgeted for 2020. Um, we put in 165,000 to HERF. We put in three, our matching up to transit of 383. We put uh, 237,000 general fund reserves this year. That's what we're budgeting. Um, and then we put $148,000 towards the pension liability this year. And then uh, the rest went to general fund expenditures. And then uh, for next year, we have 2.5 and that is the breakdown of where those will go. Again, HERF, transit, general fund reserves of 388, the pension liability, infrastructure and capital, and then the rest goes to the general fund. Other major revenues. Um, here we are, this is the state sales tax and the urban revenue share. State sales tax, like I said, is estimated to go up a six, by 6%, six which isn't a lot, really, when you look at it. It's going from um, 1,187,000 to 1,026,000. And then the urban revenue share, which is going up by 9%, is from numbers from two years ago. So the way urban revenue share is, is they look at the number from two years ago, and that's how they get their estimate of what they're going to give us. So in two years, we might see a 2% increase instead of a 9%, because that's what they're looking at is the current year, and they go back forward two years. So motor vehicle tax is going up by 3%, and then the fuel taxes for the HERF funds are going up by 1%, which is not very large. Um, and HERF Revenue all has to go towards streets and street maintenance projects. And it basically, that money funds our streets department. That's about enough to cover the streets department and their day-to-day -day maintenance of our streets. It doesn't really fund a whole lot of other projects, which means that then the general fund transfers money into that her fund <coughs> for those projects. So water revenues. Um, we are not anticipating a rate increase for 2020, which you all voted on on the 16th of April. We had that presentation. Um, water revenues, this is our estimate of what's going to come in for 2020. It's pretty flat. It's not really going up that much. Um, and then we do anticipate that there will be a rate increase for the wastewater as long as it all passes, but I don't budget that rate increase. Um, because we're not sure. It's not finally approved yet, so I, don't, I can't put it in the budget thinking that we're going to have it if we don't have it. <laughs> so um, <laughs> next year, hopefully, that'll get its final approval, and then we'll see those revenues next year, and we'll adjust the budget at the be beginning of the budget period next year to show that. 
So, on to staffing changes. As you know, um, the economic development director retired, and so we transferred over uh, the community services general manager position to economic development, and we've eliminated the community services general manager position entirely. It is not in the budget. Um, we also named the Recreation Center Supervisor as Interim Parks and Rec Director, and that position will be part of the 2020 budget. It's not really a position as of yet. Um, it'll be approved as um, in the 2020 budget. And we're not backfilling the Recreation Center Supervisor, so that's a, another position basically eliminated. Um, we are eliminating, planning on eliminating a part-time graphics design position at the Recreation Center in 2020. They're a part-time person. And adding a full-time marketing slash graphics design position in January, not for the full year, only in January for half a year. As part of the strategic plan, we have, are really wanting to promote Cottonwood and promote the city and our you know, beautiful wine country and inspire a vibrant community. And we think that this will help that, to have somebody who's dedicated to being our public information person, our graphics design person, our marketing person. So we'll be but, uh, funding that partially from that part-time position being eliminated, <coughs> and also from some of the half-cent sales bed tax that was increased for that half-cent. Um, we just wanted to note that we moved the airport special projects director from public works to the administration budget, and so that's why the administration budget doesn't look like it decreased when we eliminated the community services general <coughs> manager, because we moved someone from somewhere else and put them there. So if you look at the administration budget, it doesn't look like it went down that much, even though we eliminated that position. But if you look at public works, you'll see that their salaries decreased by that position. So that's why I wanted to make sure we mentioned that. <laughs> Can I ask you a question yes. while we're here? And thank you for saying that, because that was one of my, my questions, so that clarified one thing. But back up to the um, uh, rec center. The Parks and Recs director range 30, and this is probably a question for Ron, um, the range 30, what was the uh, recreation center supervisor range? Oh, that's a question for Amanda, 23, 23. Remember, the, the, the way I understood the hierarchy is the general services manager, which was a grade, the general 30, services manager. 33? No, 35? It was significantly 35, higher. Um, was helping oversee Parks and Rec, and um, a couple of those individuals reported to Richard. And so we removed that oversight. So now, um, in an acting role, has reports to our deputy city manager. Um, running the whole or organization right now, both the rec center and then parks and rec. Um, and the idea is that range. I can tell you that um, the organizational structure for the city of Cottonwood is not finished. It's still undergoing changes. And so I think through the next 12 months at, at a max, you will see me come back to you with other recommendations. This is trying to feel internally and not replace positions at the senior level, trying to keep keep the um, total cost of, of employees low, and this is just relooking at it. This is the the current view, but I would expect the view to continue to change. Okay, thank you. So more staffing changes. Um, we eliminated a full time aquatics coordinator <coughs> position um, that wasn't filled. It was a vacant position. And that's a $54,000 annual savings. And what we're gonna do is replace that with a 29 hour part-time position, which means they go on Arizona State Retirement. So it gives them a little more hours and they get to contribute to Arizona State Retirement. Um, so it's a little bit more than just being a part-timer. So as a supervisor, you wanna have that, that time. Um, and then we are requesting to add an accounting specialist to the finance department at half a year so that we will actually be three and a half people instead of two and a half people. Um, and that would be, again, in January, half a year. We are, our current plan is to not fund in the budget uh, two communication specialist positions. And this reduces budgeted dollars. Um, the positions currently, they have 21 current positions available. 
but they only have 17 filled. And they've been at 17 for quite a while. It's not been, um, it's been difficult to find qualified candidates who pass all the training and make it through the whole process. And so the plan is to unfund two of their four vacant positions. And then if they were to get a qualified candidate, we could reduce their overtime budget because they won't need the overtime that they are currently using to cover that, that staffing need. And so the thought is that if we unfund it, we can always add it back into the budget later in the year if approved. So just some information on Arizona State Retirement. So these are some of the benefits that the staff receives. Um, Arizona State Retirement is one. Arizona State Retirement percent percentage is going up from 11.8% to 12.11% next year. Um, that's oh, right at $1,100,000 that the city contributes. The employees also match that so they contribute the same amount into the retirement system. And then there's public safety retirement. It's a larger percentage that the city funds. Um, we budget, we're budgeting 1.7 million next year for the public safety retirement contributions from the city. And this is that contribution that we pay up front. We pay that in July because the longer they have it, the more interest it accumulates and the more it helps our unfunded liability. Uh, the police departments, um, oh, and I forgot to mention, we are also contributing that additional 259000 next year. That was part of the half-cent sales tax request. Um, we do need to adopt a pension funding policy by July of 2019. It's pretty much all ready to go. All I have to do is put it in for the agenda for you guys to adopt it. By Arizona statute, we have to do that. Um, so the <coughs> police department's percentage for tier one and tier two is going from 47.88% to 48.6%. And then tier three, which is anyone that was hired after July of 2017 when they changed their plan, they're trying to make their plan more sustainable. So they've changed the way that it works. You can only make a t up to a certain salary. You have to wait longer before you retire. There's a couple other stipulations that have changed. And those benefit rates have gone from 45.54 to 45.92. And for, that's for the defined benefit plan. But if you elect to go in the defined contribution plan, which they have 90 days to choose what they want, which one they want to go into, um, that one's going up to, from 46.11 to 46.49. And then the fire department, which is also public safety but a different plan, um, their tier one and two are going from 27.44% to 25.93. This is the first time in the 18 years that I've worked here that it's gone down. <laughs> so that percentage is going down a small little bit, but this is the first time I've seen it go down. <laughs> Uh, tier three, if you're hired after July 2017, again, those percentages are, inc are decreasing by just a small little percentage. We'll take it. Yeah, we'll take it. Anytime, right? Mr. Mayor, if I can add a couple things that um, the community sometimes has questions on, and that is um, this liability has been around for a while, but it was a few years ago, five, six years ago, that it became required by a rule change to be on the books. So one of the reasons people think the debt went up is because they have this new debt. It's not a new debt. The other thing I like to talk about is that nobody in this organization caused or had anything to do with that, that rate, the unfunded liability. If you look at the board, years ago, uh, made some bad decisions and they went from being 100% funded to being significantly underfunded overnight. And then there were benefits passed by our state legislature that caused the benefit to climb instead of reducing it. So as mentioned, a few years ago, um, there was a voter initiative to change some of the benefits to help reduce that increased uh, debt. So the state legislature has done some things. I believe now the state board, pension board, is trying to do some things. And then, of course, you guys have directed the staff to do some things to help reduce that. But it, it is not anything that our employees in the public safety retirement had anything to do with. Thank you. Oh, my, my call. It's your slide. Thank you. She gets to breathe for just a minute. So um, I'm recommending a 2% across the board um, 
compensation increase for our employees. And there's a couple reasons for that. And um, I met with employees um, today, uh, twice, to explain this. Um, my job is to present to you a balanced budget that is sustainable over time. For that to be sustainable over time, the, our increase in expenses cannot outpace our growth in revenue. So our revenue is currently only growing at about 2% um, overall, which means I need to keep, keep compensation down at that rate of the 2%. One of the reasons I'm not asking for a merit is a merit at 2% um, would not be, in my opinion, effective. The first thing it does is it causes supervisors to inflate scores, which defeats the purpose of the conversation, which is to talk about performance, how it's really happening. We all like to be nice to our employees, and they're used to getting a significant more than the 2%. And so, as I have seen as I reviewed evaluation since I joined the team in January, um, it the lower the, the differential, the lower the difference between a high performer and, a, and an average performer, the, the, the smaller the difference, the more inflated the scores get. So it becomes less effective. So I'm recommending the 2%. The other reason is we could do a 3% or a 4% merit, and the effect on this year is not horrible, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. But over time is where it really becomes impactful. So merits are given on anniversary dates. So a 4% merit is actually not budgeted at the 4% throughout. It's pre it, it, but the next year, it would be budgeted at the full amount. So the 2% is budgeted for July 1, is in our recommended budget. So it is affordable this year and affordable as long as things continue on this path next year. So I think while it's not what we all would want, for ourselves or the employees, I think it's sustainable over, over time. The other things that, that we, we're doing other things to help increase our capacity for compensation. Um, we're doing things like trying to get um, enterprise funds to pay for themselves, not borrowing money from the general fund to pay for the wastewater uh, stuff. We're looking at the recreation center to make it more sustainable so that we don't have to use general fund revenue for that. We're looking at all positions, including positions that report to me. Do they need to be filled? Can we do it a different way? Can we reduce costs? So we're taking a holistic approach to compensation and making sure it matches the growth. I had a very honest question asked of me on the way out of my last meeting today by an employee. And the question went something like this. Why should I work harder if I'm going to get the same raise as everybody else? Fair question. And I said, first of all, my HR experience throughout the years, a 1% difference or a half a percent difference is not a motivator. It doesn't create the incentives that people think it does. It's just too small. We're talking about a 25 to 50 cent difference for entry line employees. And it just doesn't act as a motivator. But the other thing is, if I'm committed to recommending raises that match our revenues, our resources, our growth, then as we control costs and increase revenue, then there'll be more opportunity for larger raises next year. I don't like COLAs. It's not the way in HR I would recommend doling out increases, but it's what we can afford this year. If we all work to uh, you know, mow the yards, keep Main Street clean, if we do things that, that make people wanna move here, work on our roads and our sidewalks. If we do things that make visitors want to come back for a second time or stay an extra night to spend a little extra money, those things will increase our revenues in sales tax, which then the next year would allow me to ask for a different type of compensation model. The other thing that I get a little ahead of Kirsten on is our benefits. I'm not asking you to change our benefit structure. I think benefits are an important part of recruiting and attracting and retaining highly qualified employees. So I'm asking you to keep uh, the benefit level that we have now and not reducing it uh, to any amount. I think the, if the impact is minimal, but the impact on morale and employees would be even bigger. So while this isn't a, a popular request, I think it's one that is responsible and that we can afford moving forward. Very good. I'll let her talk about minimum wage. Any, any questions on that before we move on, Council? Okay. Thank you. So as you know, the state enacted automatic minimum wage increases a few years ago, and <coughs> this year minimum wage will be going up to $12 in January. But we didn't increase any of the part-time budget for any um, of the departments except for streets maintenance. Um, just to make sure that they are, we also 
put in some money for some new events, for some um, new small town local events that I will mention in a minute. But we want to make sure that they have staffing to be able to clean the streets and take out the, the trash and deal with that type of event. So health insurance, like Gary said, he jumped ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> We are part of uh, Kairos, which is a, a pool of health insurance for uh, local governments and schools. And um, they are projecting that the benefits are going up 6% for health insurance. They decreased the dental costs by a small, very small amount. But vision insurance remains the same. Vision is fully funded by the employee. Um, the city does not provide any, any of the money for vision. That's your self-enrollment for that. As far as the coverage for employees, we currently cover 100% of employee costs for the health insurance. We cover 80% of the children cost, 70% of spouse costs, and 60% of family. If you look at the FY 2020 and um, fiscal year 2020 and 2019 numbers, um, that is the total we pay for health insurance for all of our employees. And you can see the breakdown between the employee and the employer. And if you look at 2019 compared to 2020, our overall <coughs> cost of the employer funds is only going up by about $133,000. So it's not really that large of an of a increase. Um, and we have done projections before and given you presentations that even increasing um, the employee portion by 10% only saves like $50,000, $60,000. It doesn't really make that big of a difference. Mr. Mayor, if I could go back to compensation real quick. It was in the slide, but I like to say it out loud so people understand. In this recommended budget is no increase for any of the contracted employees. So the four employees that report to this council, there is no increase included in the budget currently. Thank you. So on to capital requests versus budgeted. Um, in your packet, you had the full listing of capital requests. I didn't think there's no way I could put it on a slide. <laughs> that would have been 30 slides. <laughs> so I just kind of summarized, did the summary sheet to show you for fiscal year 2020. Um, the under 35,000 capital requests were about $757,000 and we're funding 178,000. And some of those items are things that we think are really important, like security cameras at the military service park. We just redid that military service park. It looks really nice, but we need cameras to make sure that no one vandalizes it. Um, another thing is a cybersecurity grant that the IT is getting, and that's part of the grant funding. And that's a, um, that is a 25% match. So a lot of that will be grant funded. And then we're also doing some um, upgrades to a repeater site to make sure that the communications are good for our dispatching and our police officers. And then a couple of projects for the streets that were smaller projects. Um, our large item request over 35,000 was 18,475,000 and it sounds really huge. But that's everything. That is all their grants. That's that $2.7 million grant right. for the FEMA. That's um, the will, finishing Mingus Avenue from 8th to Main. That's the $750,000 that we budgeted for pavement preservation and $100,000 for sidewalks. That's, um, I'm trying to think what other big projects are in there. Oh, um, the uh, airport pl master plan at $440,000. And I mean, it's a lot of large project projects. It also includes water and wastewater, which have large projects, including the 260 water line that we're putting in that is partially funded by WIFA. Um, so it's not, it seems like a really big number, but it's a lot of projects and a lot of work and a lot of things that will happen. So we budgeted 11.7 million of that request. And again, some of those are grant funds and some of those are projects that we really need to get accomplished. If I can add, um, the one project she didn't talk about was the tennis courts. So we did fund um, from that uh, the, to fix the pickleball court um, so that not the, not the whole redoing, but the 36,000 to, to get that fixed, possibly paint the one next to it so we can have tournaments and do some other things. But we really tried to um, 
infrastructure and projects, I think were a priority for this council and we did try to uh, fund those. So outside agencies funding, um, this is the list of 2018, 2019 of pretty much every outside agency. I tried to find them all <laughs> in our budget um, to list them out to show you what we funded, including the chamber um, for bed tax and the CEDC that we were giving the bed tax to. And you can see that, you know, it's for 2018, it was $463,000. And for 2019, it was $476,000. That's a lot of money going to outside agencies to help them. Um, so next year for our budget, uh, as per your request to change the outside agency funding for those large items that had their own line item, um, the senior center, the old town center for the arts, we only budgeted a lump sum. We made one line at $100,000, um, and we are going to have a program where they apply for those funds via a grant that a committee will then review and bring back to you after the budget has been adopted. Just to make it simpler, you know, um, we, we'd like to also see some reporting from them, some financial reporting, some projects, some things that just like a grant, like they're getting a grant from the city. We did keep in a lot of the smaller, like the $1,000 for Verde River days and those things, um, and the ones that were in specific budgets, but we held the line. We told them that if they got $2,500 last year, they're getting $2,500 this year. We're not gonna increase it. Um, the only one we did increase was the Ferdy Valley Humane Society. Um, as you know, we would have to have that program if they didn't do it. And they um, have the right as part of their contract to um, ask for a 6% increase every year. And they haven't asked for one since 2012. And in your packet, you'll, you should have had the, they asked for a 34% increase. <laughs> and I budgeted a 6% increase because that's really what they're allowed to ask for. So I did budget for them to get their 6% increase for next year. And it's not a large dollar value either. It's, I mean, a 6% increase from, I think it was like 40, I won't be able to find it now. 45, 43, eight. Right, so it's three, you know, $3,000 more. <laughs> they haven't asked for their 6% for a number of years. Since 2012 that? was the last okay. time they asked for it. The other thing I wanna add, if I can, is that $100,000 at the top for what we're calling a community um, outside agency funding there, the 100,000, is 12,000 more than was funded last year. So we took all the amounts and we added, we rounded it up to 100,000. So it is not less currently, unless you guys change it, it's currently <laughs> not less money. Right. Can I ask on the uh, Cottonwood Youth Advisory Commission, uh, what, what is that money that we budget 4,000? What do we typically spend that on? Um, that's for all those events that they, they do a lot of events for the Youth Commission here in town. Um, we also pay for them to go down to the league conference okay. out of those funds and, you know, some other items that they do, their meetings, any mm -hmm. paper or anything that they would need for okay. that program. Thank you. I have a question. Please. On the Humane Society, and again, this might be for Ron, and you may not know either. Um, I assumed, they, they broke down, you know, how many potential dogs and cats we could have and based on our population. They're getting money from like Clarkdale and, and other towns too. Uh, I know Sedona has their own um, humane society a little bit, but their popu Clarkdale's population is a, is a lot less. So it's probably, they're basically servicing just us and, and Clarkdale because Jerome has their own and Sedona has their own. The county also? And the county. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, because of the, okay. okay. I was just concerned because reading, reading the letter and what they asked for in the shortfall, it's certainly uh, an organization that we don't want to go out, to, go out of business or Correct. have to take responsibility for. And, and uh, I you know, strongly support the Verde Valley Humane Society. And so I'd like to make sure that they are able to sustain themselves. So just some noted items in our budget. 
Um, we are not adding any vehicles this year with the Fleet Enterprise program. Um, I think you remember last year we went into that program, we got new police vehicles um, on that lease program and a couple for Parks and Rec and one admin vehicle and we got rid of and sold at Public Surplus some of those older vehicles and so this is, um, it's nice to have the newer vehicles but we decided that this year we just weren't going to fund that and do that at this time. Um, we are also eliminating um, six vehicles total from three from water that we feel aren't needed and three from public works um, that we've asked, we've talked to the departments, we've said, okay, can you, you know, reduce your fleet by a, a small amount and that'll help with maintenance costs and fuel and, you know, make them ride together. And then we re, if I can, we reallocated one to the building official. Our current building official did not have a city vehicle. So uh, mm -hmm. water, I think Tom's in here. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you to Robert. Um, I know that wasn't an easy ask for them. To, anytime you have something to give it up is difficult. So I just want to publicly state thank you to both the Water Department and to uh, Public Works for working with us to reduce the overall cost of, of running the city. So I'm sure you've noticed before that the custodial department had its own budget line and its own section in the budget and it was one line. Um, and it used to be its own, we used to be um, funded internally, and so that's why it had its own. And so this year we just moved, we moved that into non-departmental because really it's everyone's custodial. So that's just a note so that you, don't, you won't see that in the budget this year. Um, it's under non-departmental. We increased programming in Parks and Recreation for, um, for programs. Uh, we, we, a small amount for them to add some new programs. And we told them that they had to have a 75% cost recovery to be able to have those programs. So Hezekiah has been working on a plan to, to get those new programs um, ready for council to see and how he's going to recover 75% revenues, whether it be by sponsorship or charging a small minimal fee or whatever that takes to make sure that we have a cost recovery. Um, the temporary employee budgets did not go up in any of the departments. And as we, again, we said that minimum wage is increasing, but we didn't increase their temporary budget. So they need to do more with less. Um, <laughs> they're gonna have to work on their staffing and when they, you know, scheduling and making sure that they have people when they need them. And if they don't need someone there, then they'll have to not have anyone there. Um, we moved the annual cleanup out of council's budget. It used to be always budgeted in your budget but we moved to public works because that made more sense. So you'll see that removed from your budget. So it's not gone, it's just not in council's budget anymore. And then um, the half cent sales tax allowed us to decrease our transfers out from the general fund, which is a good thing for the general fund um, and also a good thing for those other funds because then that helps them be more self-sufficient. And then we increased this fiscal year 27, 2020, Still in 2017. Um, <laughs> we increased the reserves by almost a million dollars, and that's just reserves in the general fund. That doesn't include the money that we transferred to her for the money that we transferred to the other funds. Now, you don't mean that we're putting a million bucks in just in this budget year, but that total accumulation yes. is okay. Thank you. And that is cash. That's cash. Yes. <coughs> um, and I forgot to invite Robert up when we were talking capital. <laughs> I didn't want to break okay. your stride. I was, on a, I was on a roll. I didn't want to stop. So before I you, allow you to ask me any questions, I'll, I'll have Robert come up and talk about, he has um, some information on uh, pavement preservation and streets for you to look at. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I apologize. My kids gave me a cold over the weekend, and I'm starting to feel the effects of it, so... Try to bear with me for a minute. Keep your distance, okay? <laughs> okay. I got a few jars in front of me for bringing this out, but I'll be at some point. Um, I'll get to these in a moment. These are from some of my presentations. They're a little hard to go ahead and see. <laughs> But I don't know which one he's going to condition index. Yeah. Okay. 
So what I have for you is basically a brief rundown of the anticipated payment preservation for fiscal 2021. Um, we do it in two year cycles. We get $750,000 when it comes through. So I will trudge ahead. Okay, um, in the past, these funds have been used to try to extend the life of our payments. That's what we're gonna try and continue to do. Um, it's historically done through fog sealing, slurry sealing, chip seals, or some other various things with crack seals or some other fancier types of improvements. Um, prior to this current, or this last round, we had $600,000 to undo this. Council um, increased that to 750,000. So we're anticipating that level stays the same this year. So my purpose for being here is to hopefully see that you guys concur with what we're recommending you go ahead and do. So um, before I jump in this real quick, which is what this is here, um, we looked at the strategic plan to make sure that we align with the goals. Obviously, infrastructure fell under a number of categories, um, not just roads, but also sidewalks and other improvements like bike lanes. So all of those will be incorporated into these as they get rolled out, um, but we didn't want to burden everybody by seeing three slides on two presentations for it. Okay, so the goal here is to come up with a new decision-making tool. Um, in the past, we've kind of just had a general list, nothing to really watch from year to year or cycle to cycle to see how or what kind of impact we've had on the system. So the goal is to do that. And in doing that, we've developed a pavement condition assessment set of maps. And basically what it does is we go out, we drive all the streets, we take pictures, we look at them, we assess the roads based on good, not so good, and then really bad. Um, so, and then we assign a color to those. So hopefully, as we go through time, we can target certain colors, see those improve, and then watch our better colors not degrade so much. So it helps get, bring things up a little bit quicker, hopefully. All right, so I have in here these maps. Obviously, they're a little bit small. So this one here is just your whole city overall. And you can see we've got some colors here. And there. is the condition network of our streets. So obviously green is good. Um, we have a few areas where we see that. Uh, Mingus Avenue, the section just got done. Um, it's a little hard to tell up on the screen, but you have Mesquite Hills, which is new, uh, 12th Street, which there's a little bit of an issue there, but we'll talk about that as well. Um, but then as the rows age, they see different types of distress, and those are assigned to color. So. This is kind of the, the north half, of, or north third of the city. I broke it up in three sections. Um, obviously, the bulk of the streets are in this part. Then you've got the middle section, which is down by uh, you know, our retail areas, where you've got Walmart, uh, Fry's, Home Depot, and the residential neighborhoods there. And then, obviously, we have our road system, which does go all the way down towards Camp Verde by Quarry Drive, but we have very few roads out there. So we're not gonna focus too much on those at this point in time, okay? So what I'd like to ask a question of you, and this is really a, a big question is, does the color of the road signify its condition? Um, what I mean by that is, if you see a road that's black, do you visually see that that's a good road? And you see one over here that's gray, and you think, eh, that's not so good of a road, right? So that's what I'm, I'm curious to see what your opinion is. And the reason is, is because that we have some different options to look at as what we can do to maybe save some money, extend our dollars, and tackle some more streets, depending on how we look at it, okay? So um, some of the benefits, uh, again, of the black color is great, it looks new, it's a great road, we should be okay. Over time, they fade and everything else. But if we started off with a gray road, okay, it looks similar to what it was, it's an improved street, it has better qualities to last another five, 10 years, however long we've kind of designed it for. Now we've got a lighter color, it reflects the heat. Now we're eliminating some of that heat island effect. Um, we don't have as much of it as Phoenix does, but that is something that could be an issue and you know, it may at some point 
be enough that it could reduce the temperatures in the neighborhood so people don't have to have the air conditioner on as long. So that, that's maybe a stretch, but <coughs> we think about that. So how do we deal with that color issue? Um, we can do a couple different things. One is to look at chip seal versus rubberized chip seal. And I've got a picture on the next slide of that. The conventional chip seal is more of that gray finish. Um, again, hard to tell. You know, it doesn't seem like a good looking road, but it's actually fully functional and been improved and works well for us. Um, the picture on the right is a rubberized chip seal, so it's got that blackish color to it. So now you've got that aesthetic that people think, okay, this is a good near road type of deal. Another option is to look at doing a chip seal versus a cape seal. Um, again, gray color on the right or the left. On the right hand side, now it basically is a chip seal that gets a slurry on top of it. And that basically fills in a lot of those open voids, reduces noise, extends the pavement left a little bit more because you don't lose the rocks as quickly. And you also get that nice black color and it lasts a little bit longer. Okay. That's the, I'm sorry, the, the cape, yeah. cape seal? The cape seal is the one on the right. It's a, you can't see the word in there, so I put the wrong color down, so I <laughs> it didn't work too well. Okay. So then, does the Cape still have the heat island effect as well? It would, yes. It would, okay. You have that black color, correct. Yeah. Is that an extra process? Yes, it is. Going over the top of it. Yeah, basically, it's, it's a two-step process instead of a single-step process where you come in and put the chips down, then you come back with another piece of equipment and do a slurry on top of it. So a little bit more expensive to go ahead and do that, but you do get kind of a longer-lasting surface out of that. Which one lasts longer? Um... <clears throat> it's going to depend on your traffic mostly and the wear that you're seeing. Uh, the rubberized chip seal, the chip seal, they can work uh, both in the same range, you know, five to ten years. Um, average would be about seven years for the life on those. Uh, if you get a higher volume road, you're probably going to see more three to five years on that life. Um, the cape seal versus the chip seal, again, you're going to see somewhere in that six to eight year range on the lifespan for those. So um, these are some different things that we can look at. So basically, they're all wear-wise pretty yes. much equal. Yeah, these are more of a, a way to reestablish a wear surface on the roadway versus actually reconstruct it and get down to where major failures occur, which is down in the subgrade. Um, so basically, this is a way to almost put a Band-Aid in a sense, but it's a more of a long-term Band-Aid than just doing like a crack seal type of deal. Okay. Um, so those are some options. So I guess my question for you is, is do we think we can live with a gray road somewhere? Um, is it something we might want to try? Do you like the black color? And then we just throw that idea out. Uh, just like to get an opinion, or just a, a feel from you guys, what you think. And again, to be clear, the gray road, the advantage there is just the heat, heat island, reducing uh, heat island the heat island effect. And less cost, because we can go cost. ahead and we don't have that second treatment or the additional uh, cost to put the rubber on the chips itself. But it does last as long or does not last as long as the other treatments? Maybe about the same about amount the same. of life. Okay. Yeah. So in my personal opinion, I don't care what color the road is as long as there's not holes and cracks and things that look bad and are going to tear up my That's car. Understood. So if the, the gray is less expensive than the others, I'd be okay with that. I second that. Yeah, my concern <laughs> is longevity as well. I don't want right. to you know, scrimp on costs and then have oh, sure. to replace it Definitely. more quickly. But mm -hmm. as far as color, I really couldn't care less. Okay. So, I would agree with that. Okay. Me too. Great. Ruben, do you have a input? <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all. <clears throat> okay, so with that, my thoughts for a program for this next cycle of money. Um, when the last cycle was put together, we concentrated mostly on collector roads. Now, at that time, the thought was, let's try to get in and start doing some more of these local roads. That way, we can extend the life of those. Uh, they're lower volume streets, so we can hopefully maximize our dollars by doing a treatment that can last a little bit longer. You know, we put a five year, seven year treatment on there. Low volume, hopefully we're gonna get maybe seven to 10 out of it because we've got that lower volume. So we're gonna shoot for that. So the thought was, is let's start jumping into some of the neighborhoods. Um, the previous map showed that uh, an area to concentrate on would be the area to the east of the cemetery between uh, 14th and 16th Street, Navajo to Maine. And then from there, work our way to the south so we're talking this area over here, first we start with and then branch down into the area between uh, Main Street Dominguez and 10th, uh, Smelter City area, Scott edition, and then from there we would continue going to the south where we would actually um, get into uh, Dominguez Park, phases one and two, which would go all the way down to Hill Street, um, from 12th Street to Main. So try to tackle all that area there. 
Um, with that, the previous map also had identified some areas to the south of Meeting Lake A. Um, 6th Street, 8th Street, 7th Street, 10th Street, Date, Elm, um, basically from 89A down to Fur. Um, right now, that kind of takes us through the money that we have for, that's roughly $400,000. Now, we have budgetary numbers, so there could be some chance for additional savings in there, and if there is, I'd like to continue branching to the east of 6th, or to the west of 6th Street to try and get as much area as we can. But that's kind of the, the thought process on the first phase is, you know, spend $400,000, try to extend the life of these roads, really make a big impact by touching a lot of street. So, okay. The next thought is Mingus Avenue. If you've driven in lately, basically from the roundabout to Maverick, um, you'll notice where the water line is, there's some trench failures starting to happen. You can see the road is starting to settle a tiny bit and you see some cracks forming the asphalt. So, unfortunately, that's probably a weak spot in the subgrade. Obviously it is a weak spot, but that's probably from poor compaction on the water line that was put in there. So the thought is, um, actually I was out last week at a streets conference and I was talking with a company where they come in and actually inject a polystyrene type uh, material. They can actually lift that pavement up and fill the voids and then stop those uh, cracks from continuing. So I'd like to explore that a little bit more as an option. Um, I think for that stretch for $50,000 we can stop those from happening anymore and really try to extend that payment a little bit longer. And then we can come back and crack seal over top of that. So overall, you know, 750,000 is what we talked about. I just rattled off about 400,000 plus another 50,000 on there. So what do we do with the remaining money? Um, option, which would be great, is to purchase a crack seal machine. machine. So our crews in-house can go ahead and take care of that. Um, and I believe that was put into the budget as we have right now. Um, on top of that, we have, um, there's five bridges inside the city limits and ADOT every two years comes out and does an assessment of those bridges. It's part of an FHWA pasture that they have to inspect the bridges. We don't want something happening like it did up in Minneapolis on the interstate up there where we lost lives and really wasn't a good situation. So um, as a result of that, they come out, they do an assessment of our bridges and these two projects here on the Pima Street Bridge Deck Repair and Structural Repair for the bridge um, basically are some recommended projects to help extend the life of that bridge so it doesn't degrade anymore. So we're looking to go ahead and take care of those. And then we have parking lots in the city. It's been a couple cycles since we've done anything on those. I think 2015, 2016 was the last time we touched them. I'd like to come back in and go ahead and take care of resealing those and help extend our life of the, the pavement. Okay. So that's kind of the overall fund proposal. The other thing to talk about, which was brought up, is there are still some projects that are carryover um, from the current cycle or budget to go ahead and take care of. One is the Main Street Road Diet. Um, we are working on making some final changes on the striping, and the plan is to hopefully have that going here this May. So that'll be coming right around the corner. Um, I just got numbers back from the stripers today showing what the changes are um, from what we had originally and it's minimal uh, compared to what it could have been. Um, the next piece is Mingus Avenue, A Street, Washington Main, Kirsten touched on that a little bit. I'd like to finally get that done. Uh, that one got slowed up a little bit. Circle K as you're aware is trying to do some work on that corner, um, trying to coordinate efforts with them so we don't have to pay for something they might be willing to go ahead and do. So um, that's slowed down a little bit but we're going to try and get that all coordinated and wrapped up. And then last one was 12th Street resurfacing. Um, that's a, a boo-boo from the previous round of uh, pavement preservation that was done. Uh, basically, the surface got a uh, fog seal type of treatment put on top of it. And it was too closed to go ahead and accept that. So basically, we got, basically, basically we got a sheet of rubber on top of the roadway. And when it got wet, our emergency safety equipment had issues getting up the roadway. So the surface got milled, reestablished at least friction, and now we're working to try and get a solution to take care of that. Whose boo-boo was that? Uh, the boo-boo basically was internal on the recommendation to go ahead and do that. Okay, so we're eating that. Yeah, that, that's, that's what it's pointing to at this point. So, and that's what I have for you on payment preservation.
Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Winnick? Yeah. Seems like we're stretching the dollars much we're further to. this year, so that's and great news. I do have one more presentation. <laughs> I promise I'll breeze through this one a lot quicker. This is on sidewalks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, sidewalks. Obviously, this is something that we all feel strongly about that we need to have a place for our pedestrians to be so they're not in harm's way by having a vehicle hit them or anything of the sorts. Unfortunately, history says, you know, we've had $80,000. Council was gracious enough to increase that to 100,000 last budget year. However, $100,000 won't go very far when we're talking sidewalk. Um, so basically, I'll give you a brief rundown. Um, the goal of this program has been to fill in, do infill projects of sidewalks on the collector and arterial streets, not focusing really on locals at all. Um, just due to low volume, low speeds, and everything else. Well, our current list, as we saw the last time this brought up, has got about 33 entries on it. Um, 33 entries, and that's really small text, um, but basically there, there's just a lot of different segments of sidewalk to go ahead and fill in. Ultimately, as a worst case scenario, we'd be looking at about $5.2 million to do all that. At $100,000, you can, <laughs> take a couple of zeros off and you realize it's going to take 52 years to get through. Um, obviously, not ideal. So we're looking at options to go ahead and try and make it more cost effective, whether that's with an asphalt path, eliminate the sidewalk, put some sort of a, you know, a couple foot like landscape buffer between the edge of the roadway and that walking path to try and do it. Focus on just one side of the street to try and stretch our dollars. But again, $100,000 doesn't go very far. Okay. Um, this map is difficult to read, and I left it on my conference table at the office, so I don't have a bigger one, but it really wouldn't give you a whole lot more. But basically, you're looking at the city. North is actually oriented to your left, and there's a bunch of colors with circled numbers there which correlate to each of the projects and what the anticipated cost is in that table. Um, really, you know, we can pick any one to try and do, but uh, I think uh, Mr. Corbin suggested that we're trying to go ahead and, as part of a land trade deal that we're working with a uh, landowner down here in Old Town, is to finish off Cactus Street sidewalk, and this is kind of a, a condition, right, of getting that uh, land trade to go through. So we're focusing, trying to take care of that. Um, right now, I've got plans of probably about 75% complete on that. Estimate showing about $98,000 to get that done. Um, so that wouldn't leave a whole lot left over. I'd like to go ahead and push that 2000 into the following year, but uh, obviously it's it's not great. Okay? And that is what I have for you on sidewalk. <coughs> not great news, Mayor, on the sidewalk <laughs> issue, um, but again, priority can be set by council. One of the things that doesn't, um, that hasn't really been talked about is that $1 million reserve in CIP. There's nothing, and Rudy, correct me or Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's nothing that says you cannot move that into sidewalks. Again, I like our city engineer suggestion of maybe looking at walking paths or multi-use paths to lower the cost so we can get more done one side of the road. I think his approach is spot on to make the dollar go further. But if you did want us to be more aggressive on this approach, um, there is nothing that says you couldn't use some of those reserves. We do brick pavers. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Oh, and that's you, right. You guys gonna labor Great more? idea. <laughs> yeah. Free labor. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do like the idea of, of <clears throat> looking at how we approach, you know, accessibility. And if, it, if, if we can get accessibility and safety through other means than a sidewalk and make it stretch further, I think, in areas where it's appropriate, it makes a lot of sense. You know, but I think, I mean, I'm open to having a conversation about how we're going to get more aggressive too on funding sidewalks. I think it's, I agree. it's, it's important to the council. It's important to the council because it's important to the community. So how, how are we going to get more aggressive about it? And if it means using some reserves or anything else, then that's something we should consider. Yeah. I'm not a fan of, of using reserves, but I, I do agree that we need to start mm -hmm. trying to put more than a hundred thousand dollars in the, mm -hmm. in the sidewalks. It's just obviously, you know, looking at the list, doesn't go very far and we have some rural areas that have needs if 
that's all we can do every year. We're, it is going to take 52 years. <laughs> right. I mean, I there's, there's nothing to say that we couldn't use a portion of that reserve and then let it build back up and then use a portion of it, you know, um, like allocate 250000 more and then leave, let it go for a few years and build it back up with the half cent sales tax um, that we are setting aside for CIP. And then, you know, just every few years go back in, take some out and put it towards that program. And we would get there a lot quicker than 52 years. It still will take a while to get there. I think it is something. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. Let's remember about you. Uh, thanks. Rob, you had mentioned something about getting very little benefit, I think, from putting that 200 something into retirement fund at one time, and you'd thought maybe. Yeah, so one of my recommendations, again, um, we have it currently budgeted at 252000 to go into the, that number, um, into um, the public safety retirement system um, to pay down early. Um, given the size of the debt, um, it has minimal impact. If you really wanted to move that into sidewalks, uh, into, which is a CIP project, it's not staffing, not those kinds of things, truly to give back to the community, then that is well within your authority and, and ability if that's the direction you want to go. But I don't see it, correct me, Rudy or Christian, if I'm wrong, but I don't see it as making an impact on your long-term uh, debt for that, for the pension liability. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm all for paying down debt. I love it. Uh, but when we don't re when we aren't really seeing any benefit from it, essentially, um, and we can take maybe take that money and use it towards something that's tangible and really helps the community, and they see that, I'm kind of in favor and look of looking at that. You know, at one time we had a, a a fund set up specifically for sidewalks. Whatever happened to that? Not since I've been. We, we've never really had a fund to set aside for sidewalks. Every year we allocated $80,000 for, for sidewalks, but we never really had a fund for it. Every year we just allocated $80,000. We, this council increased it to $120,000 to $100,000 last year, which of course is about two years ago, which is, which is really helpful. To, but we never had an actual fund for, for sidewalks. It lapsed. Whatever we didn't use, it lapsed at the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Sir. <clears throat> I'm concerned that <clears throat> we don't really have a, a plan in place that's, that's sustainable. I don't like dipping into our reserves, you know, and letting it build up and then dipping into it again. I, I don't know if that's a, a great way to fund the massive amount of infill and new sidewalks that we need here. So, um, and I don't really know what that program looks like, but I think we need to kind of take a hard look at that. In the short term, I agree. I think the $200,000 from PSPRS is well spent on making some infrastructure improvements regarding sidewalks in the community. Um, but unless, unless our financial experts feel otherwise, I think that money would probably be better served. Then the question is, uh, uh, Robert, do you have a recommendation on where that should go first? If I could get back to you on that, that'd be preferable. Yeah, just so I can. That more than triples our sidewalk yeah. budget. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then could we, uh, <clears throat> for future years, we had that was a ten percent um, going there. Could we put that ten percent directly towards sidewalks? That'll start to get us instead of every year having this conversation about not not paying it towards the retirement or towards the pension debt put just automatically that would put 350,000 a year or something in the in the sidewalk budget the 10 percent that we were giving to PSPRS yes put that in, dedicate that to sidewalks mm -hmm. so if it if it pleases council and mayor what we can do is uh, bring back before the tentative budget in June so in one of our so probably the second uh, uh, council meeting in May, we'll bring you back that number and that proposal and the recommended sidewalks that we start with so that we can get it kind of voted on if we're gonna change the formula that Kirsten follows on the half cent sales tax. So we'll bring back this portion of the discussion for the second council meeting in May. Before we, well, we could, or we could just bring it back with the tentative budget. Do that too. That adoption. Is the council generally on board with that? Mm -hmm. I don't have enough information. I mean, I was, Rudy looks a little uneasy. He yeah, always does. Do you look uneasy? <laughs> Are you uncomfortable with that? Um, and, and so no, I, 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 I'm curious. I've got a couple of questions. And let me ask. 
does, does their schedule include potential cost increases if it takes us 10 to 15 years? Sure. Actually, all the numbers right now have a 15% contingency built into them. So that should account for any increases in costs as we go forward. But it's also um, some uncertainty right now because we don't have finalized plans. So that way as we go through, that kind of goes away and shrinks down. So, so personally, I'd, I'd like more information, and I think that there was a suggestion that we could talk about that at the next meeting, that we talk about this. Okay. okay. Yeah. Let us, Mayor, if we will regroup on this Great. and uh, come back. I think we'll go ahead and do it early so that we have, we're not debating this on the budget adoption day. Sure. So we'll bring this back for the second meeting in May um, with a list and, and uh, uh, answer Rudy's questions. Because you're right, if, if, if uh, our finance folks were not comfortable with that move, I wouldn't recommend it. Right. Um, so we'll we'll re regroup on this and come okay. back. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions for me? Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other budget questions? <laughs> I, I had one last question on the trench failure. Sorry, Mr. Winicky. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> no, leave that there. Just briefly on the trench failure, was that, yes. is that a city issue or was that a contractor? Or something? Uh, at this point, it's well beyond the two-year warranty that we go ahead and ask for okay. on those, so it would just be a, a city issue to take care of this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Or no thank you, but. <laughs> <laughs> that one it is what it is, right? <laughs> so that's all we have uh, for tonight. Uh, to present again this is a recommended balanced budget but you guys have the authority to move or change or redirect um, the next time we bring this back for discussion is scheduled for june which would be when we would adopt the tentative schedule which sets the max expenditure level mm -hmm. um, so really we're looking for feedback tonight um, or how you how else you might want to proceed okay council what are your what are your thoughts on the proposal I'm very happy with it. I like the way it was presented this year. Um, I like what you've done, so good job. Thank you. I agree. Um, I think you. I, it, it shows you've done a lot of work on it. I know you have done a lot of work with all the different departments, and I think made an effort to um, to get their to get their feedback. And I'm happy. Mr. Mayor, if I can just comment, because um, people are looking at me when, when the hard work. I just ask the questions. Um, our finance staff uh, has done a bang up job in putting this together. Helen and Kirsten have put in a significant number of hours. But that's really the face. Behind the scenes work, when you have all the department directors making sacrifices and making priority decisions and putting forth their, um, we had a budget, we had a budget meeting um, last week i think it was to talk about the cip list that you now have in front of you and really the discussion was what do you have to have what what do you need to keep moving forward not what do you really want what not what makes your job easier but what do you really need and they were honest and forthright on their discussions and i and i just couldn't be prouder of a group of directors and department heads than the ones I've been working with through this process. So I appreciate their adjustments to my style and the questions and everything that we've gone through. So the, the work really is everybody else. You're right. I'm looking at you, but I mean, I realize this is one of the biggest teamwork items that gets done within the city. Mm -hmm. so thank you, everybody. And it is very obvious that everybody worked together to try to do exactly what you said and focus it on what is needed rather than what everybody wants. So I appreciate the sacrifices that budget heads and staff are making too. Any other thoughts from council? Anything that? I just wanted to echo uh, briefly what Councilmember Althaus said. This presentation was really well done to all of you that um, did it. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's just um, me or if the presentation, just the style was so much easier to understand this year than last year and then the first year around. Um, so that makes it a lot more helpful to make the substantive or to just analyze it and, and be able to make substantive decisions when I'm not trying to flip through 50 pages of different numbers that are in two-point font. So very nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Although I did get my magnifying glass out. 
<laughs> that is fair. For the sidewalk presentation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they want to make sure you still have to use it. Yes. <laughs> you doctor in business. Okay. Especially if you bought it just for that reason. <laughs> right? Well, I echo the, the comments from my colleagues up here. Um, and to you, Ron, thank you for investing the time to meet with the council um, and you know, share your proposal with us. Individually, I think it's gone a long way to help us all kind of embrace this council. And thanks for investing the time in your staff to, to make sure that everybody's on the same team um, and working through this together. It's, it's difficult, it's difficult every year, but again, this is the biggest decision that we have to make up here. And I think you're making it uh, simpler for us to really focus on what our, our directives are through our strategic plan. And I just really appreciate that this budget document is directly tied to that. And I appreciate it too because we base our strategic plan off of the uh, off, off our constituents. So it really is a is a good reflection of where this community wants to go. And also, thanks for bringing this budget out to the community through all the outreach efforts that staff is is doing. I think it's very much appreciated. Thank you. I think that's it. Unless there's anything else. Motion to adjourn. Wow. Second. second. <laughs> okay, Councilmember Allhouse made the motion. I believe the Vice Mayor seconded it. If we uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. Does that mean there's no meeting tomorrow? No meeting. No meeting tomorrow. No meeting tomorrow. Wow. Come on. No.